Good afternoon. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee will now come to order. This hearing will explore efforts to expand knowledge and treatments to help individuals afflicted with neurologic and mental health disorders. Without objection, the Chair and Ranking Minority Member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses, we have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. And without objection, for the purposes of participation in today's hearing, we welcome Congressman Mike Thompson to the subcommittee. Today's hearing will address the critical needs for better treatment for neurologic and psychiatric disorders and how the neuroscience community can best facilitate research to advance and accelerate discovery of treatments and cures. Every year, the more than 1,000 disorders of the brain and nervous system result in more hospitalizations than any other disease group, even more than heart disease and cancer. Neurological illnesses affect more than 50 million Americans annually at costs exceeding $460 billion. Neuropsychiatric illnesses like schizophrenia, mood disorders, and autism are the leading cause of disability in North America and Europe. In the United States, the cost in lost earnings due to psychiatric disease is estimated conservatively to be $200 billion per year. The toll of brain-related disorders is enormous for individuals and for families. Veterans returning from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been particularly hard hit by neurologic disorders. Traumatic brain injury, defined as a disruption in brain function that's caused, caused by a head injury, has become known of, as one of the signature wounds of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan because of the insurgents' heavy use of explosive devices and armor which has better protected soldiers from um, life-threatening injuries. And that's dis, you know, despite the fact that we have better protected soldiers. A disproportionately high number of returning military personnel also struggle with psychological health issues like post-traumatic st stress disorder, clinical depression, anxiety disorder, sleep disturbances, and substance abuse. The psychological toll of these wars has been particularly harsh because of prolonged exposure to combat-related stress over multiple rotations. Unlike the physical wounds of war that maim or disfigure, these conditions remain in invisible to other service members, to family members, and to society in general. But emblematic of the great tragedy of war, especially this war, the toll these individual uh, invisible wounds take on lives is great. Treatments to reverse or delay these injuries and disorders are critical and would benefit both the military and civilian populations alike as approximately 1.7 million civilians sustain a traumatic brain injury as a result of car accidents, falls, or other blows to the head every year. The field of neuroscience, which is the study of the nervous system, has made significant advances in the last decade, providing new insights into the functioning of the brain and underlying disease mechanisms. Yet many questions remain, spanning the most fundamental, such as how do we keep our brains healthy, to the specific challenges of finding diagnostic tools for diseases like Alzheimer's or schizophrenia and determining ways to effectively treat TBI and PTSD. The federal government has a vast array of research initiatives devoted to advances in neuroscience and our ability to treat brain injuries and mental health disorders affecting uh, both military and civilian populations. Many of these federal initiatives involve extensive coordination with civilian and non-governmental sectors, including multidisciplinary, multi-sector research programs and centers. We'll hear about these efforts today. Likewise, private foundations have played an increasingly important role in expediting the drug development process by bridging the gap between promising scientific discoveries and entrepreneurial expertise and funding needed to move them forward. The role of government and private foundations has become especially critical to progress because unfortunately, despite their immense profits, the pharmaceutical industry has been cutting back the research and development of central nervous system medications due to the high cost and high risk. As we're here today, this could have a devastating impact on the drug development pipeline for neurologic disorders. Without collaboration across all sectors, government, industry, and nonprofit, neuroscience breakthroughs will stall in much needed treatments for all Americans, especially for our men and women in uniform who have endured injuries in service to their country, will not materialize. I hope this hearing will raise awareness about the critical role neuroscience has in developing treatments 
to reverse or delay some of the impacts of neurologic or psychiatric disorders that millions of Americans are inflicted with and will stimulate creative thinking about how to best advance discoveries and treatments for the broad spectrum of devastating brain-related injuries and disorders that continue to impose a heavy burden on individuals in society today. Uh, before I, I recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. Jordan, I want to say that the reason why this hearing came about is because uh, Representative Kennedy, who has uh, throughout a great period of time communicated to me his concern that we delve into this subject in a, um, a methodical way, that we contact all sectors, and that we try to find ways of creating um, benefits for people through either uh, recognizing the synergies that exist or where they don't exist in sufficient numbers, helping to make sure that resources at some point will be available to help uh, facilitate greater coordination. Uh, Representative Patrick Kennedy has been a tireless advocate for innovative, cross-disciplinary, collaborative biomedical research and has provided unwavering support to those with psychiatric disorders and as well as returning veterans suffering from signature war injuries affecting the nervous system. So, um, Pat, I want to thank you, uh, on not, ju not just on behalf of this committee, but on, on behalf of members of Congress for your assistance in this vital area. Uh, you've made so many contributions to this Congress, but I think that as life goes on, uh, this is going to be an area where you're uh, leaving an enduring mark uh, for uh, your wisdom and your compassion and, and your sharing of, of your own experience with, with all of us. I mean, you're a person of great integrity and courage, and I, I'm, I'm honored to have served with you. Uh, at, the, at, I, at this point, I would uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, too, thank uh, you for having this important hearing and for the work that uh, Congressman Kennedy has done on this uh, subject. I have a meeting I've got to get to in a few minutes, so in the interest of time, I'll ask the Chairman if we can just submit my opening statement. Uh, without objection, so, we'll so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, for your presence. Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Kennedy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate those very generous and kind remarks, and of course, a ranking member, Jordan, thank you for your being here to help kick this important hearing off. And to uh, my other colleagues, uh, Mike Thompson, whose uh, work uh, in this area, but also whose service today is highlighted because of his uh, um, service to our country as a veteran in our military and that perspective that he brings in his work in this area. So appreciated. And Mr. Foster, uh, thank you very much, Bill, for your being here and your uh, efforts and I thank, want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, putting this hearing together, and also your staff who've been so instrumental, uh, <clears throat> Jaron Burke and Claire Coleman, who's uh, been helpful, and Justin Baker, and all of those who've been so critical in putting this uh, event together. And my own staff, uh, I want to thank uh, Dan Murphy and uh, Laurel Havis and my whole office for all the work that they did in putting up with my aggravation at trying to get all this pulled together. <laughs> They've just been the best and I uh, want to thank them tremendously for this. And I have uh, Chris uh, Ken who does all my veterans events in Rhode Island who I want to acknowledge who's put together a veterans diversion program for those ending up in our criminal justice system because of dint of their wounds on this war which are ever higher uh, rates. And we're doing that on October 5th and Rhode, uh, October 25th in Rhode Island. I want to thank Chris for his work on that. And I want to thank John Sack for all the efforts that he put in as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, I also want to acknowledge some real other uh, heroes here in this audience, and uh, none the least of which has been the former Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, former U.S. Senator, but most important to all of us, an American hero in the truest sense of the word. And that's Max Cleland. We have an amazing lineup of people who've come to testify today. I want to thank all of them for being here and say we're really at a point today where we're going to examine where we are today in neuroscience and most importantly uh, what the stage is for us to set for us to really move forward much faster, more effectively and uh, certainly to deliver the answers to neurological disorders and disability 
now more than ever because of how it affects our American heroes, our nation's veterans, the signature wound on this war, brain injury and PTSD. Um, we have the biggest burden of illness amongst the civilian population, but the civilian population today is going to be looking to the fact that our heroes are going to be the catalyst to bring us to one mind on brain research. No more divisiveness. Let's unify. Let's get behind our veteran. When they win it, we all win it, as is always the case with our nation's heroes, and in this case especially. So we have a bunch of great testimony today. We'll learn from those in the civilian sector how they can be helpful in their research to help our veterans, which should be our number one priority. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. Have an opening statement and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognize Mr. Foster. Uh, Chair recognize Mr. Thompson. Thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich, and thank you for having the hearing, and thanks to you and uh, Representative Kennedy for inviting me to uh, uh, provide testimony today, and my thanks to everyone who's here who recognizes this as not only a huge problem, but one that we can uh, really get uh, ahead of the curve on. Um, mental illness impacts uh, us all a, a great deal. The chairman pointed out the uh, financial cost, and uh, while staggering, I think that those uh, dollar costs really pale in comparison to uh, to the heartbreak and 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 the, the pain uh, that families uh, uh, go through uh, because of uh, of mental mental illness. And with one in six of our adults uh, have uh, in the country today with diagnosable mental illness, it's really hard to find a family that isn't somehow touched uh, by mental uh, illness. And as, uh, as uh, Patrick Kennedy said, uh, our veterans are certainly uh, a, a cause that we all can rally around. And I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be able to say something on their behalf and honored to be in the same hearing room with Senator Cleland, who uh, is, in fact, a, a, true, a, a true hero. And, and we see more of our military personnel returning from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, not with physical injuries, although they're a, a huge issue, important issue as well, but with mental injuries, uh, including PTSD, anxi anxiety disorder, uh, or depression. So the call for research and support for a cure for brain illness uh, grows louder and louder uh, each time one of these veterans uh, returns home. Uh, reports indicate that 19 percent of Iraq war veterans and 11% of Af Afghanistan veterans suffer from, uh, from mental illness. The brain has been called the last frontier for medicine, and the time for that to end, I believe, is right now. It's time to bring together all of the different groups, including the federal government, the Congress, private industry, academia, everyone who has an interest in brain illness, to fully explore and to tackle this problem once and for all. Every year in my congressional district, uh, they, they hold the single largest fundraiser uh, for mental health. It's called the Staglin Music Festival for Mental Health. And the proceeds from this fundraiser, this annual fundraiser, has now reached over $94 million. It's used to fund research, to find better treatments and cures for schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, bipolar disorder, and depression. Uh, another great hero who's with us today is Garen Staglin. I see him in the, in the front row, and I don't know where his wonderful wife Sherry is, if she's here uh, or, or not. But the two of them work tirelessly for mental health and for, uh, for, to raise the money to provide uh, research funding for, uh, for mental health. Uh, their work to find a cure and to improve treatment for brain illness is inspired and it's driven uh, by a very personal story. In 1990, their son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. It was heartbreaking. It was a scary time for them and for their son. But they took that heartbreak and they turned it into a benefit for everyone who cares about the advancement of mental health. In 1995, they started the International Mental Health Research Organization, which raises money for mental health research, collaborates and, and, uh, and, uh, and affiliates with organizations, and works to build awareness of scientific achievements in the field of mental health research. The Staglins are very fond of saying the rewards are much greater if you run toward the problem, not away from it. 
and we're fortunate that both Garen and Sherry uh, are running towards the problem of mental health and not away from it. And the rewards, uh, as I mentioned, have been great. So I want to uh, make sure we recognize that they're making an immediate difference in the lives of millions of people. And um, I'm uh, really proud that you're here, uh, Garen, and of the work that you're doing. And then I, too, would like to join the uh, chairman in recognizing uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Kennedy, for his work on mental health issues. Uh, he, he's been tireless. Uh, the entire 12 years that I've been in Congress, uh, I, I don't know anyone who's worked any harder on any single subject uh, than Patrick has worked uh, on this. Uh, he's done so much good for so many people, and it, it really saddens me uh, that you're leaving Congress because uh, so many people uh, are going to lose in Congress a great advocate. I know you'll always be uh, be working on this stuff, but he's just a, a tireless uh, fighter. So uh, I want to pledge to you, Patrick, that uh, I'll keep doing um, everything you tell me to do <laughs> to, to make sure that we can, as I say, get ahead of this. <laughs> everything you tell me to do in regard to working on mental illness uh, issues. <laughs> it's a good thing you made that distinction. <laughs> and uh, and it. Everyone that has said it is, is right on. Now is the time. And, and, uh, and the emphasis on our veterans, I think it, 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 it just uh, punctuates the, uh, the need uh, to uh, really double down and get this done. So I thank you very much. And I yield back. And thank you for letting me testify. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, any other members who appear will be uh, given uh, five legislative days to be able to make uh, an opening statement. Chairman. Congressman Walter Jones uh, arrived. Uh, Congressman Jones, do you have a statement that you want to make? Uh, Chairman, just Without objection, come on up here, have a seat. This is Congressman Walter Jones from North Carolina, um, Republican uh, member. Very brief. Why don't you have a seat, okay? Uh, in my comments, I have Camp Lejeune Marine Base in my district. Chair, yeah, let, me, let me do this. They, they, want to, they want to get your words down. Nothing like being late. Uh, okay, thank you. I uh, have Camp Lejeune Marine Base in my district. Uh, we've had a number of suicides of our Marines who have been frequently deployed. We're having more problems with families staying together. I want to thank Patrick Kennedy for taking the lead on this and asking me to join you, Mr. Chairman, and the other members here. My biggest concern is that uh, at some point in time in the very near future, we're not going to be able to do what we should do for those who are suffering from PTSD and TBI. So I wanted to be here today to listen, to learn, and also to be very proactive with my friends. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, other members who uh, appear when, once the testimony begins will be given five legislative days uh, to submit statements for the record. Um, before I begin, introducing our panel of witnesses. Uh, I, you know, I apologize for being a few minutes late, but I ran right into the room and focused on my script and get the hearing off, to, off and running. Uh, but had I noticed Max Cleanland in the room, uh, I, would have, uh, I, I would have spoken, as some of my colleagues have, at, uh, to his exemplary service to our country in so many ways. Uh, when I came into Congress, Max was one of the first people I consulted with from that other side of the Capitol. Uh, and I have to say, Max, it's an honor. You honor us by your presence in this room. I, I am so grateful that you continue to serve in other capacities. I mean, you, you really, I mean, you know, you know how I feel about you, and when I saw you, I thought, wow, Cleveland's in the, in the audience, so, <laughs> so thank you. Um, our first panel, Dr. Thomas R. Insel, M MD, is that right, Insel? Uh, is a director of the National Institute of Mental Health. His tenure at NIMH has been distinguished by groundbreaking findings in the areas of practical clinical trials, autism research, and the role of genetics in mental illnesses. Prior to his appointment as NIMH director in fall 2002, Dr. Insel was professor of psychiatry at Emory University. Uh, next, Dr. Uh, Walter J. Uh, Koroshetz, is that right? 
is Deputy Director of the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Before joining NINDS, Dr. Koroshetz served as Vice Chair of the Neurology Service and Director of Stroke and Neurointensive Care Services at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was also a Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical. Joel Coopersmith, MD. Uh, Dr. Coopersmith is Chief Research and Development Officer for the Veterans Health Administration of the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Prior to joining VA, Dr. Coopersmith was Dean of the School of Medicine and Graduate School of, Bio uh, uh, and Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and Vice President for Clinical Affairs at Texas Tech University. Uh, finally, Terry Rauch, PhD, currently serves as the Director of the Defense Medical Research and Development Program within the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. He has responsibility for the Defense Health Program R&D portfolio. He has over 30 years of experience in many facets of the military health system and has held numerous senior level positions in the Army and Office of Secretary of Defense. I want to thank each and every one of the distinguished uh, panelists for their presence here today. It's a policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would, I would now ask that each of the witnesses rise, uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I would now ask that each witness give a brief summary of uh, your testimony. Keep the summary under five minutes in duration if you can. Your complete written statement will be in the hearing record. Uh, and I don't know if you can see the clock there. Uh, there's a... Oh, you, you, you have it even better. You have a watch. But we have a little box there with colored lights. I don't know if they're facing in your direction. Um, let's begin with Dr. Insel. And thank you for being here, sir. Please start. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I really appreciate the committee's interest in this issue. And I also want to thank uh, Congressman Kennedy for what has been a very long period of passionate leadership. We're going to miss you tremendously as you move to your next post. I can only hope that uh, you'll come work for us at some point uh, so that. <laughs> what do you think all those appropriations were over there? <laughs> uh, regular order. <laughs> Go ahead. The um, National Institute of Mental Health is part of the National Institute of Health uh, part of the Department of Health and Human Services. And Dr. Koroshetz and I will talk about this perspective on these disorders and the urgent needs we have from the NIH side, both for NINDS and NIMH. I think rather than go into the um, details of my testimony, which you have in front of you, I'd like to just take you through um, a, a pictures that may be more helpful for you to uh, expand on some of the things, Chairman Kucinich, that you already mentioned in your opening statements. So if I can have the next slide, let me talk a little bit about what it is when we talk about this burden of illness uh, that people refer to. When we think about uh, this in numerical terms, we use uh, something called the disability adjusted life years. It's an unfortunate term, but it has to do with how many years are lost to disability. And you can see from this graph, I hope, from the World Health Organization numbers put together in 2008, that neuropsychiatric illnesses uh, broadly represent almost 30 percent of all the disability from all medical causes from non-communicable diseases. So that ranks them well above uh, heart disease, cancer, and many of the things that most of us often think about as the big killers. Part of the reason why the disability rate is so high is that some of these actually be become chronic diseases and they begin early and as was already mentioned, they're common. So the high prevalence also drives these kinds of numbers. In the next slide, you'll see that if you break this down, Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, we skipped one here. Can we go back one, if that's possible? That the actual uh, disorders within uh, this category include uh, depression, alcohol, Alzheimer's disease, and many others, with depression being really the number one driver for the sources of disability. 
it's really uh, a powerful statement that uh, so much of medical disability is driven by this one group of illnesses, all of which occur quite early in life. We tend to think of these as the chronic disorders of young people. But it's not just that they're chronic. They're also, and, and not only that they cause morbidity, they also are a source of mortality. You'll see in the next slide that suicide, uh, which is 90% of the time involves a mental illness, accounts for over 34,000 deaths each year in this country, which is an extraordinary number when you put this in context. As you'll see in the next uh, bullet, that uh, that's almost double the number of homicides. And at this point, based on the numbers released about a week ago from the uh, National Safety Transportation Board, more than the number of deaths from traffic fatalities, which is just extraordinary. Now we have a whole criminal justice system to deal with the homicides and a whole uh, transportation safety system to deal with traffic fatalities. And one might ask, what do we have by comparison to handle this growing issue of suicides in America? And it's not only suicides that are driving mortality, but lots of other sources of medical illness. And you can see in the next bullet that in fact in the United States, the life expectancy today for someone with a serious mental illness is about 56 years which according to what I looked at, at on Google uh, about a week ago is about the life expectancy today in Bangladesh. So this is not where we want to be uh, in 2010. It was already mentioned before about the economic cost involved here. In the next slide you'll have a picture of that. When you, I, maybe this will be difficult for you to see, but the last column over shows that if you'll hit the next bullet, that it's about $57.5 billion in healthcare costs that go to mental illnesses, which is just about what we're spending each year for cancer in the United States. What's dramatic about that are two things. First, that that is a huge increase from where we were a decade ago. So these are really now driving upwards relative to many other medical sources. And maybe second, even more importantly, this barely captures the real costs uh, economically, because most of the costs of mental illnesses are outside the healthcare system. Next bullet, you'll see involve next uh, the costs of lost earnings, of welfare next, and that uh, incarceration, homelessness, school and home care, all the places where most care or failure of care for health care for mental illnesses really play out. Next. So we, th we estimate that the actual total comes to about $1,000 per American per year that we're spending the way we do this now to provide what is obviously mediocre help to people with these very disabling and chronic illnesses. Next. If that's the bad news, I need to tell you that uh, we're not just facing huge challenges, but really unprecedented opportunities. And I wanted to take just a couple of minutes, if I can, to flesh those out. There are really two that I'll speak of very quickly. The first has to do with the recognition in the next bullet that these are indeed brain disorders. They're not disorders in the brain disorders the way stroke or Alzheimer's might be, but they're disorders of brain circuits. And we've been able to now define those with the help of genetics and with the help of new technologies. We also now recognize in the next bullet that these are developmental disorders. I mentioned that they start early in childhood most of the time at a time when the brain is still developing. But this gives us a real opportunity for thinking about how to intervene. And you'll see in the next slide that we have a whole range of technologies that have been developed over the last five to 10 years that are real game changers here. For the first time, we can study brain circuits at a, with a kind of precision that we could only dream about 15 to 20 years ago. And that has made this a tractable problem where we should expect to see tremendous progress over the next uh, decade. You'll see in the next slide, and we'll just run through these very quickly, that we've already begun to describe the circuit basis of most of the major disorders. This is depression, next is uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, next PTSD, one that we're going to talk much more about this afternoon. But in each case, we've begun to identify the major nodes in the brain, the importance of the prefrontal cortex, which is really the kind of great last frontier for neuroscience, and it, it, we've begun to open up real opportunities for new therapeutics. Let me finish up by saying that this is uh, an enormous challenge. I don't want to give you for a moment the sense that we've mastered this problem. I'd like to say that we probably know about 2% of what we need to know. But we need to do this in a way that, as Congressman Kennedy said, will be collaborative and will be a joint effort. 
There's an old African proverb that says, if you need to go fast, go alone. If you need to go far, go together. And we need to do both. So I'll show you in the next couple of slides how we're thinking about that. In the next slide, you'll see, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, let's go ahead and hit the, uh, this go run through this. We have a number of projects with the VA next, with a total of uh, about almost nearly 100 grants across 23 states with about $41 million in investments that we're now doing. And uh, just keep hitting the bullets because we don't have time to go through much of this. But I'll, I want to I make sure you understand that this is by no means a siloed effort. We're not balkanized any longer. There's a lot of effort going on both intellectually and practically to make sure that we're working very closely together. And finally, in the last slide, let me just say that uh, probably the largest effort that we've mounted uh, at the NIMH in the past uh, 18 months has been the STARS, the Army STARS initiative, which we're doing very uh, closely with the Department of Defense. Uh, the, this really responds to the um, increase in suicide, which we've heard a little bit about already. The, Increase has gone to 160 in 2009 and uh, 239 if you include reserve forces as well. In a recent publication, the Vice uh, Chief of Staff, Pete Corelli, mentioned that from his perspective, it appears that uh, we may be losing more soldiers to suicide and to uh, high-risk behaviors than we are to combat. And this has to be the highest priority. And we have now entered in with them uh, a very large study, we call it a Framingham-like study because it's really looking at the entire Army and, and trying to understand risk and resilience for the forces and providing information back as quickly as we can to promote risk and, or to promote uh, resilience and to reduce risk. So uh, we can just put up the last slide. I want to thank you for your leadership in this area, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I look forward to having a chance to discuss any of this much further with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Koroshetz, please. Thanks very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit uh, maybe deeper in the weeds than, than Tom went, but I think a lot of things are, are very uh, complementary. So we're going to talk about uh, what we're doing to try and understand how the brain works and how we're working together, actually expressing the collaborative piece on developing disorders. Uh, next slide. So our problem is that we have a lot of disorders. Um, there are, some people count 600 neurological disorders that, is, uh, that our institute is trying to attack. But the message here is that, you know, we have to go one by one to get a drug, but to make real progress, we need basic science discoveries that are gonna cut across multiple, as opposed, uh, because one, one, one by one is gonna take such a long time. Next slide. So this slide basically gets away from the numbers and, and just reminds you of, of the, the real tragedy that occurs when you lose part of your nervous system function. It, it really defines what is a human being, what makes us different from the next person. And, uh, and so there's real, real personal tragedy behind all these diseases, unfortunately. Uh, for people who are interested, I refer you to the website. We actually did a very kind of in-depth, bare bones, look at how the NINDS works, how, where we need to improve. We got experts from the extramural community, different government agencies, industry, academia, disease organization leaders to look at, to, we brought them in, we, we bared our soul, showed them how the Institute works, and we got really good recommendations uh, to move forward. And, um, out of this, and you can see the details on the website, but the mission is, is reaffirmed, which is to reduce the burden of neurological disorders through research. And we think there's two main pillars on which this is gonna stand. Firstly, we need to understand how the normal brain and nervous system develop. Much of what we think happens in repair when there's a brain injury is just be beginning that developmental program all over again. So we'll, the more we learn about how the brain develops, we think, the more we're going to know about how to affect repair once it's injured. We need to know what goes wrong in diseases, and then we need to be able to translate this knowledge from basic and clinical discoveries into better ways to prevent and treat neurological disorders. There's a number of other points here which you could read more about, but I'm going to hit some of them as we go along. Next slide, please. Now, this point uh, has come up already uh, in the chairman's statements, and I hopefully will come up again. And it's the fact that um, 
when, when, when push comes to shove, if you have a neurological disease, you need a particular treatment, a particular drug, a particular type of treatment that's going to help you. And, and it's, it's got to be specific. And we eventually have to go from our basic knowledge to a very specific treatment. And if we don't do that, if we don't take advantage of our preeminence in biological sciences to translate to really what are commercial products at the end, the patients see no benefit. And needless to say, the economy sees no benefit from the government's investment. So, and, and it has been said, major pharma is now shunning neurological disorders as unacceptable risky investments. They have very high development costs. They have a high failure rate when they go into the clinic. And the more and more we know about the diseases, we get smaller and smaller markets for them to make profits on. So we, we have to try and solve this problem. And the word that's used around NIH now is the word de-risk. So what NIH sees is that their role currently is to try to take the basic knowledge, try and actually develop molecules that will be treatments, and bring them as far along the pipeline as we can to, and, and until the risk is so low that an industry will pick them up. And that's kind of the general idea. The big problem that we've, we, well, there are a lot of problems, but one of the big problems that we have hit is that if the sad but true stating that if you are a mouse and you have disease X, don't worry about it, we can fix you. But if you're a human with disease X, you better worry because we don't have something. So we've been able to do really well for the mice. The problem is when we go from the mouse to the human, something, we're missing something. And, and we need a bridge. And we talk about biomarkers, and maybe this will come up later. A biomarker, in my mind, is a way to bridge what we know from the animal disease to the human disease. So that we know when we go into the human, and we hit this biomarker, it's going to give a high chance of success. If we just go into the human and treat the brain as a black box, then there's a lot of guesswork, a lot of things can go wrong, and that's the idea of this bridging biomarker. So this is a big emphasis now. You'll hear about it, particularly with regard to Alzheimer's disease and this big ADNI project. That's a public-private partnership to develop biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease drug development. Next slide. Now, NINDS does not work alone. We have so many disorders. We need everybody working together, and, and we basically work very closely with the, the uh, tremendous numbers of, of really innovative neuroscientists that, you know, most belong to the Society for Neuroscience, the professionals in the neurology, neurosurgical, psychiatry, emergency medicine, many different professional societies, and, and these private organizations, these organizations that are disease-related that have the real motivation and, and dedication and persistence to galvanize communities are essential for us to carry out our mission and, and perform tremendous, tr really tremendous research now. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Now, this is a really busy slide, and this is basically a slide of how we conceive of the pipeline going from on the left the, the, the basic science R01 investigator grants, which are the mainstream of the NIH investment to really make most of the innovation in the American scientist pool to bring out new basic knowledge. And, and that's really the critical thing that everything is based upon. But once you have that knowledge, you have someone who is interested in this other area has to go in and try and pick out from that knowledge something that's going to be a useful treatment. And then there are a number of steps one has to go to until you get to the proof of principle in the animal model, show it working, and then go into the human. So this is not rocket science, but it's a process, and it's well known to the pharmaceutical companies, and now NIH is really getting interested in how, how we can move this further to the left, taking the risk out of drug development. What I've listed here is a number of the programs that NINDS has in this arena, and the, the ones in green are ones that we do with many institutes at NIH. The ones in blue are ones that we generally have disease organizations as our partners. And the ones in red are the ones we usually have industries as our partners. And just a couple to point out, just yesterday we announced that we will be working on a public-private partnership, much like Alzheimer's disease, to develop biomarkers for Parkinson's disease drug development. We have a network that we're going to set up that will be nimble, be able to move from disease to disease, to test the best therapies available out coming out of neuroscience and biomarker-informed trials. And, we, and the, the, neuro, the NIH blueprint, important to know about the blueprint, it's all the institutes at NIH. They come together and they decide what they can do together as a group. And here, they've put together this Neurotherapeutics Grand Challenge, which is trying to really fill the pipeline with, with really creative agents that can help 
many different kind of neuroscience diseases, not just NINDS diseases or NIMH diseases, any neuroscience disease. Next slide. In terms of brain injury research, uh, we have been, have, have been working really hard with our DOD and VA collaborators um, to try and make a dent and try and do something that will improve the recovery of our soldiers and protect them potentially in the future. So NINDS is the leading funding agency and has been for traumatic brain injury research. TBI is the leading killer of young adults. What a couple of things we've done recently is we have set up, and I'm the co-director of this with Dr. Armstrong at the Uniformed Services University across the street, a center for TBI research. And this is investigators at Walter Reed, National Navy Medical Center, uh, Uniformed Services University, and NIH. It's about 56 investigators. Uh, working with a fairly good budget, trying to make a dent in many different areas of traumatic brain injury research. It's an intramural program at NIH and USIS. Uh, we have a common data elements project that's been done with a federal interagency group that has, has members from almost any federal agency related that works in the area of TBI. And what they've been working on most recently is standard ways of collecting data so that no matter who is doing the study, what agency is funding it, they, they're collecting the same type of data, so this data can be combined and mined, and the value of the data goes up substantially. We also have, are working on projects with DARPA. They have an amazing prosthetic arm. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but if you haven't, it's really worth it. Tremendous uh, new prosthetic arm for, for uh, upper extremity amputees, and we're funding projects so that, so that soldiers will be able to control this from brain activity. Um, the, uh, the NIH is also participates in DOD grant review, and we're working now with Uniformed Services and some of the other DOD groups to develop an MRI scanner that will be just do brains, but can be small enough to be taken far field in, in, into, the, into the military. And finally, we do, again, another uh, phase three trial of progesterone ongoing in acute TBI. And we are uh, tr working with a military site to, to bring them in the San Antonio uh, TBI uh, tr uh, level one trauma center. Next slide. I'm going to end really where the beginning is, and that's kind of in the basic science. I just want to tell this one story. There's lots of stories like this, and the, and the, and the, uh, the details change. But this is an example of how really basic science that you had no idea that it was going to be helpful to brain diseases turns out that it really is. So th basically, these little pictures here are, are microbes. Um, they're not even real bacteria. That's how primitive they are. <laughs> But they have these channels in their membranes that when light is shown, shine upon the membrane, the channels open. And really in innovative scientists have been able to take this gene from these microbes, put it in viruses, transfect brain cells, and now the brain cells have these channels. And they can go in with laser lights and with amazing temporal and spatial accuracy, they can then shine the light, the channels will open. Some of them will shut the cells off, depending on what channel, some will turn the cells on. And for the first time, with this technology, you can actually activate circuits in the brain, as opposed to what we did before, was just send electricity in with a wire, and nobody knew where the electrons went. This is really specific, really tremendous. And it's only been out a couple of years, but you can see from these papers mentioned that there's real disease-related work that's come from this stuff that started in microbes. Uh, so for instance, they've been able to show that you, when someone has a spinal cord injury, they lose their ability to breathe. They can now put these channels into mice with a spinal cord injury, activate the breathing circuits, and the mice start breathing again. So just a great example, lots of stories like this, of where the basic science, you can't tell where the advances are coming from, but a tool that, that it comes out of this that, that you didn't have before and really allows a lot of breakthroughs. Next slide. And that's basically what I wanted to say, it's short, and, and, uh, but I hope it was interesting, and I hope, uh, I'm hope happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Dr. Cooper-Smith, you may proceed. I want to also thank the committee for inviting us and for having this hearing. And I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Insel and Dr. Koroshes for their slideshows, which also act as a basis uh, for what we have to say. Um, VA is one of the largest medical programs in the country, one of the largest research programs, and it includes close academic affiliations with major universities and medical schools. We have over 3,400 researchers working on 2,300 projects and supported by approximately $1.9 billion in funding from all sources. We are widely supported by the Department of Defense and National Institute of Health grants, 
Our pharmacy coordinating center that is part of our nationwide clinical trials program recently won the Baldridge Award and has worked closely with NIH and DOD on projects. Our collaborations with relative partners are extensive and essential to our advancement of research. Our cutting-edge neuroscience research has extended from seminal studies on how memory is organized to the only evidence-based treatment for PTSD, to Nobel Prize work on neuropeptides, to a variety of genomic advances. And I will highlight some of our findings and some of our research in PTSD, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injuries, and our work on the uh, DECA DARPA arm uh, that was just mentioned. We are a leader in PTSD research, currently supporting over 100 studies and spearheading the national dissemination of two evidence-based psychotherapies that we have proven to be most effective for PTSD, cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure therapy. We're also undertaking three large studies in the long-term assessment of PTSD and associated health conditions in Vietnam veterans, and we uh, have other studies which include genetic assessment of PTSD, genetic assessment of resilience to PTSD, treatment for sleep-related disturbances, and strategies to engage veterans in early PTSD treatment. Uh, VA uh, directly, uh, our research directly affects uh, our PTSD guidelines, and our guidelines are developed jointly with the Department of Defense. We have increased our research funding in traumatic brain injury, and at the end of, at the beginning of uh, FY 2010, started three research centers dedicated to detecting and treating TBI. Uh, these include one that's going to specialize in uh, PTSD and TBI and how to distinguish one in basic science, <coughs> and um, one that's um, going to deal with other aspects of TBI. VA is at the cutting edge of methods for detecting mild TBI through the use of biomarkers, imaging, and eye tracking assessments, and is investigating, as I said, the links between TBI and PTSD and how to improve diagnosis of each. We are also studying repetitive brain injuries combined with aging to determine whether these injuries can lead to neurodegenerative diseases, and there are some initial findings in that. We are also, and have always, invested substantially in spinal cord injury research and recently started a spinal cord injury consortium to better address the needs of veterans with these conditions. One project involves combination therapy using bioscaffolds to implant stem cells with growth factors to repair and restore function. This approach, as Dr. Koch has intimated, is successful in rodents so far, but um, we are testing it in um, non-human primates, and it does hold promise to restore spinal cord function over the long haul. Another group of studies we're doing is on functional electrical stimulation that applies low-level currents to nerves of spinal cord injured patients to stimulate muscle activity uh, for movement of limbs as well as for bladder function. Now, our work on the new generation prosthetic arm, I think, is an excellent example of mutual beneficial results of collaboration. This is the arm that Dr. Koresh has mentioned. It was, it was developed by DARPA. We are doing the clinical trials and optimization of it and we have completed studies in 22 male and female veterans and military personnel and others. We are testing the, the uh, prototype, which has flexible socket design and innovative control features. And one of the important developments that's also been mentioned is uh, that we will add uh, the addition of brain-computer interface technology. This is a, a group that is working at the Providence VA with a number of uh, associated medical schools funded by us and also funded by the National Institute of Health. And uh, right now the DECA arm is controlled by sensors that are in the feet, so it can only be used while sitting or standing, not by walking. But with this brain-computer interface, uh, we will enable individuals to walk and to command this um, uh, prosthesis through thoughts in the brain. Time does not permit me to discuss other VA neuroscience studies, uh, but these are included in my written statement, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Dr. Raj, you may proceed. Um, Mr. Chairman, be, uh, before I give my uh, statement, I'd like to thank Mr. Kennedy 
for his uh, hard work in this area. The, this old retired soldier very much appreciates your efforts in this critical area. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss Department of Defense research efforts to advance our understanding of neurological and psychological trauma. We greatly appreciate the committee's support of our efforts to discover and develop diagnostic treatment and prevention strategies to help the many brave men and women who have been afflicted with these debilitating disorders. Mr. Chairman, without a doubt, the devastating nature of neurological and psychological trauma is one of the most difficult challenges we face with respect to research and development and the translation of discoveries into clinical care. The central nervous system allows us to interact with the world around us. Therefore, any neurological or psychological injury can be devastating not only to the service member, but also to the family members as, as well. Psychological trauma in many cases has proven responsive to various therapies, but it remains a difficult challenge to identify and effectively treat. Recovery from psychological trauma is often complicated by co-occurring physical injury, depression, substance abuse, and the threat of suicide. Even mild cases of neurological and psychological trauma can have devastating effects on lives, careers, and, and families. Uh, the Department of Defense has developed a, a comprehensive research and development program for the study of neurotrauma and psychological health. The programs focus on, on basic mechanisms of, of disease and applied in clinical research that address prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and rehab. Uh, this research and development is conducted by investigators within DOD, within the VA, within NIH, and within leading academic institutions and also in industry partners. Psychological trauma has posed a significant threat to service members during Operations Iraqi Freedom, now Operation New Dawn, and Enduring Freedom. An estimated 20 to 40 percent of service members experience behavioral health problems post-deployment, most often PTSD, depression, uh, and interpersonal conflict. Studies have also shown evidence of increased strain on, on families. Our highest priority in neurotrauma research is the diagnosis of TBI. Um, specifically mild TBI. While moderate and severe TBI are relatively straightforward to diagnose, mild TBI can be difficult to assess, particularly if the service member has an injury that w wasn't witnessed. Our, our goal in diagnostics has been to identify the unique biological effects of TBI and to leverage that knowledge to identify or develop more effective objective diagnostic tools that will determine the, the presence and severity of brain injury. To meet this challenge, we have funded research on more than 60 different technologies over the past four years. These include blood biomarkers of TBI, identifying unique electrical patterns of the brain um, uh, indicative of injury and, and the severity of that injury um, and more valid and reliable neuro, neurocognitive diagnostic tests. Uh, with regard to treatment and rehab research on neurotrauma, we currently sponsor more than 70 projects investigating drug and drug combinations.